So welcome everyone. I'm Irene Harold. I am the new Dean of the Library at, since August 1st, and I am honored to welcome you to tonight's event. I want to thank the Friends of VCU Libraries for making this event possible through their financial support. The Friends support VCU Libraries programming and help us to meet the many different needs of our community. If you're interested in joining the Friends and making a gift, you can find literature at the back of the room, or Kelly told me she was going to be uh, dropping a link into the Zoom chat for you. So now a few words about our featured guests. Many of you already know Joan Gausted. She has a long connection with the life of VCU and in Central Richmond, particularly in the art and literature scenes. She earned her BFA from the VCU School of the Arts in 1975 and has been continuously active in the arts as a creator and supporter. Joan has participated in solo and group shows nationally and internationally with work included at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts and in the Michael Smith installation, It Starts at Home at the Whitney Museum of American Art an installation at Sediment Arts Richmond based on Household, a book in collaboration with photographer Michael Lees was curated by Amber Estivia and Claire Zitzow. I knew I was gonna fumble that name, sorry, Joan. In reading Joan's work, her zine, and tonight's featured book, her words capture the beauty of life. The creative combination of visual and textual reminded me of the work of Jack Kerouac. My father passed away with Alzheimer's. Excuse me. And Joan achingly captures what I felt. Her phrasing, such as before your beautiful brain became so tangled, just resonated with my heart. The love for a dear one who is no longer there, but still there, shines through this touching work. Sorry, I didn't mean to make you cry. So Joan's book, Someone's Missing, and I Think It's Me, Our Great Adventure with Dementia, was published digitally by VCU Publishing earlier this year. It's a meaning-filled hybrid of memoir, advice, art, and honors her marriage to her late husband, Gerald Zanotto a beloved longtime School of the Arts faculty member. You can download a PDF of the book for free on Scholars Compass, VCU's digital repository, and you can also buy a copy uh, from Chop Suey Books, and the hardcover edition is in the back of the room. Currently, the Anderson Gallery on West Franklin Street is featuring an interactive show tied to the book, Someone's Missing, featuring work by both Joan and Gerald as well as artifacts from their life together. The exhibit runs through September 29th and we hope you'll plan to visit it. Joan will be joined tonight in conversation by her longtime friend and her first reader, Sarah Monroe, MD, VCU Emeritus Professor of Infectious Disease. Welcome Joan and Sarah. Thank you so much, Irene. I'm so glad that you're here and your enthusiasm with Chris for VCU and RBA makes me so happy. And thank you, Gregory, Gregory, for all you do a lot. And um, I also want to thank Kelly Gottschalk, who um, I just don't have enough time to thank her for everything, but she was a reader of very early manuscript and pass it on to people who didn't know me or Jerry so I could get some insights, a hospice nurse, that was very valuable. And then ultimately she passed it on to VCU publisher, Sam Bird, who um, really connected with the book and the writing and um, offered very uh, vital and tactful edits, which I really appreciate and worked with uh, Gregory on doing this amazing slideshow and just so many other things. And um, let's see, and thank you all for being here. I, I um, am just so happy that we can be together on this historic day 
when um, the last of the uh, monuments in Richmond has been replaced by air and we can breathe. <laughs> Okay. Let's see, I also need to thank my studio assistants, my three millennials, Hilary Fail, Megan Goldfarb, and Eli Gray. The book could not exist without them. And uh, my present studio assistant, Alex Ward, who um, has, has been so vital to everything I'm doing now with this. And uh, will be handling sales for Chop Suey Books. And I just want to say quickly that um, the proceeds go to the BC Scholarship for Undergrads for um, Sculpture and Painting. And uh, the book at, with Chop Suey comes with a little zine called um, Not Missing that transcribes the diaries. And tonight, extra bonus feature, you get Household, which is a book um, Michael Lee's um, photographer and I collaborated on. And that brings me to um, Michael curated, actually pretty much created the show at Anderson Gallery. Um, he took the images in the book, like the license plate that says doubt and blew it up 10 feet wide, blew the diaries up huge, put them under a table on the wall under a painting. It's really wild. So I hope you'll see it. It's open now and the reception is Friday, the 10th, six to nine. And uh, as Irene said, it's open through the 29th. So Someone's Missing, and I think it's me, is a picture memoir um, that tells the story of an artist couple, me, and my beloved husband, Jerry Donato, on our, um, well, let's see, as we try to navigate the terrors and mysteries of early onset dementia. And being Jerry, there's humor, and being Jerry, there's beauty. Um, and I want to read actually a bit from the beginning of the book. Um, it's a piece I had submitted to New York Times Modern Love and they rejected it. And when I looked at it later, I really had to laugh that I ever thought that they might publish this. And I hope you will laugh too. I call it Modern Love. So I'll start reading. Um, Someone's missing. I walked into Nine North to find my still so beautiful husband in a faded flowered, ho flowered hospital gown. Biting into the apple, I brought him. He said, someone's missing. And then looking at me with a mischievous smile, he added, and I think it's me. Lying on his bed, I grabbed a crayon to write it down. So often as his brain grew more tangled, he had said stunning, seemingly unforgettable things that were soon erased by the drama or trauma to follow. The worst bringing us here, the psych ward. Still smiling, Jerry mused about the bruises covering his arms, bruises I had feared were being inflicted when I heard soon after our parting kiss the night before that he had been seized and forced into an ambulance, having bolted after only one week from the lovely assisted living facility I had thought would save us. Howling helplessly in my car, I raced to the emergency room where I was denied any access to my husband or even knowledge of how he was until morning. Is this even legal? Only the pastors would speak to me. Do you have a spiritual practice, they asked. I used to be a Buddhist, I spit out, forgetting everything I thought would sustain us. Fuck the moment. For years, I had been trying to convince Jerry's doctors that something was wrong. But with his fit body and seductive wit, they would respond, leave the poor guy alone. Everyone should be so healthy. And he was amazing, a speed walking, weight training yogi. Joan changed my wicked ways. He'd wisecrack five packs a day, fried everything. This wild Chicago artist was admired in genteel Virginia for gorgeous paintings that showed his joy in life. A ravenous reader, his compassionate nature came through when he put aside his stacks of books, New Yorkers and nations to read every obituary from 9-11 in the New York Times. He was still a fascinating painter and teacher, beloved for his badass humor. And yet there were crazy times like when in Hurricane Gaston, our 
basement flooding from the walls like Niagara, he began filling a bucket at the tap. If we're going to mop, we'll need water. Heart sinking, I knew the first diagnosis of attention deficit disorder could not be the whole story. The result of a cognitive test had been, he doesn't test well. The MRI, CT scan, PET scan, and draining of sp spinal fluid were not as convincing that something was wrong as Jerry's failure with the draw the clock test. His incredulous neuro neurologist went pale. At the university, Jerry was the classic absent-minded professor, adored by his students, and for their sakes, he took early retirement, never admitting his fears and joking. I've looked at enough bad art, and now I need to make more bad art of my own. My hope was that he'd be able to continue to paint as his favorite artist, William de Kooning, did beautifully into the last stages of Alzheimer's disease. Jerry's work had become watery and lovely, unlike the rich layers and colors, depth and raucous humor he was known for. His signature and alter ego, the earless Mickey Mouse, Mr. Man, was gone. His paintings were diluting, dissolving, disappearing. I could not bring myself to help Jerry make art as I did with seemingly more intimate tasks. This was something I encouraged our young studio assistant to do. The upcoming retrospective of his work at the university gave good reason for hiring even more helpers without him having the sense of being watched. Staying in our home and creating our own way to deal with this illness had been my plan. The bathroom issues are usually the deal breakers, our counselor had said when one morning I found, instead of urine down the hall or on the windowsill or me, what I hoped was poodle poop floating in our tub with rubber ducks shampoo bottles and bath brushes. There will be no deal breakers. I strung Christmas tree lights to the toilet and painted the bathroom walls bright coral to make the fixtures more visible. Still, Jerry would be up all night, putting on as many of our clothes and hats as he could. Next, you'll be in a suit of armor, I teased. Your knight in charming armor, our young nieces once called him. Then things got scary and sleep impossible. He would try to leave the house. Can we go home now? I could not turn my back. Our exhaustion made for more confusion than aggression. His heartbreaking, where is everyone? What have I done wrong? Became a terrifying, where are they? Screamed in my face, forcing me to flee. I tried to get him to talk about what was happening. Jerry, you're always the one I can turn to. And now what's most on my mind you won't hear. The few times I broke through the denial, his grief and fear were so profound, I never wanted to take him there again. He rarely commented on the losses, driving, dressing, reading, writing, speaking, only five words at a time. I would count on my fingers. He still had his humor. Come here often, he would always ask on our walks and I would always laugh. Finally, he added too much. Three plus two, five. We had been together my whole adult life. And as our art dean friend said in an article about the retrospective, no one ever says Joan or Jerry. It's always Joan and Jerry. It was a life of art making, reading, and endless talking, all lost to us now. We compensated, never having listened to music with lyrics because it conflicted with our constant conversation. We began to play opera with dinner and dance to Muddy Waters and Sun House. His mind could no longer discern the difference between a toilet and a sink or even know what certain body parts were for, trying to pee with the strings of his sweatpants or his scrotum. Joan, this isn't working, he'd laugh, and I would too. Yet once out walking our little pound poodle, Jerry stopped suddenly with an expression of intense sorrow as he looked at a dying dogwood tree. The empathy was so pure. I asked my dear friend Sharon, why is it? I think the confusion and the violence are the illness, but the compassion is the real Jerry. Because it's true, she said, and it was. I'm gonna stop there. John, that was beautiful. Every time I hear it, <laughs> it gets me. Um, to start out, I, I think I would really be interested in having you tell everyone where 
where this book came from um, and, and how it evolved. Uh, did it begin with you writing things down? Uh, did it begin with the images that you saved? Can you tell us a little bit if about the creative? If I can just creative? say first that Sarah was not only in the story, she was the first reader. This is the original copy I sent to her, which she read Blue Mountain Lake and the Adirondacks and put these birch bark post-its, which were, you know, very helpful as far as the writing, but also things where I'd say, why didn't I stay? Everything would have been different. And she wrote, no, it wouldn't have. Yeah, I kind of shredded you a little <laughs> Just bit every now and then. <laughs> so yeah, where it came from. Yeah. Well, you know, it was eight years of the illness. And when I was out walking during the time, I'd always be strategizing, thinking about what, you know, how to help him, what to do. And then, you know, suddenly that was all gone. So I was out walking and it was still so filling my mind, the stories. And I just, I'd come home and I just um, jot them down and I'd put even like these little cartoon things in this notebook. And, you know, started thinking, maybe I'll make a book out of this. But then I kept, you know, I'd have shows or I'd do this and that. And then I sent, when I sent the modern love piece in and it was rejected, I thought, oh, right, well, I'm a painter, whatever, and just sort of put it aside. <laughs> but it kept <clears throat> pulling me back. And uh, at a certain point, I was pinning the stories up to the wall of my painting studio. And I had, with every story that came into my mind, an image would come. Jerry's license plate, I'd go down in the basement and pull it out. You know, um, you asked, you told me one story was too long and should be two stories. And I thought, well, what would the other image be? Oh, the plaster ice cream sundae. You know, <clears throat> that just seemed like such a gift. And um, so it kept going. And then at a certain point, Ashley Kistler, curator, our curator friend, um, came over and I showed her this mess and she said, yeah, I think you should do this. I think you should do this. And um, so, but it kept going sort of back and forth. And um, finally, I was knocked back a bit physically and it was a little hard to paint. So I thought, you know, this would just be a good time to really give this a shot. I, I'm gonna take the summer and just really see what I can do. And if at the end of the summer, I feel like I have mm -hmm. something and so, I did was it, continue. Was it therapeutic for you? You know, it really bugged me in the beginning when I said, oh, I'm going to write this book because I really, I wanted it to be, you know, sort of mothers against drunk drivers. You want suffering to count for something. I wanted it to be like something I could offer. I thought I've learned a lot. I have this to offer. And it was going to be sort of, a, I thought, I was looking for the book that I couldn't find, and I thought it was some advice. But I realized later that what I had really wanted, I had over 30 books that I took down to the early onset support group. I wanted a book that made me feel less alone. And when I realized that, I know I've told you this, my incredible repeat Uber driver, Trevino, first read the household book and had such interesting insights I gave to him and I said, I'm working on this other book, could you, because he'd lost his wife to um, breast cancer, but I'm really learning that cancer can go into dementia and I don't know if it's the treatment. And he'd lost his wife fairly close to the same time I'd lost Jerry, which at that point was for him about six years before. So when he picked me up the next time, he said, I'm not giving that book back. It was this early one. He said, if I'd seen that book on the Barnes and Noble health shelf, I would have, I would have gotten it because it makes me feel less alone. Even my children didn't understand. So I wrote that down and I put it on my studio wall. And every time I think, oh, I don't know, I think you're doing this. This is what you wanted for yourself. This is what some, you know, someone else found useful. So that's sort mm -hmm. of the whole trajectory, I think. So it was therapeutic. It, it was, it did end up. And, you know, I think I'm always reading the science section of the New York Times and actually Jane Brody had a piece on how um, 
writing graphic memoirs for people who have had loss, it has been shown to be much more healing than counseling or this or that, which I do think are also very important. And I, I looked at it and I thought, yeah, you know, I, it, it, I mean, for me, honestly, it was also a way to just be, keep Jerry with me because some of the stories made me very happy and you know, a lot of them make me cry. I got through this without crying, and um, which I didn't do in my studio today, but no, it, it really was. I think it's interesting that it was specifically graphic memoirs yeah. that were therapeutic as opposed to just yeah. written memoirs. Yeah. Um, I, I would love you to tell everyone how you came up with the cover image for, oh. for the book. Well, it was originally a, a different cover in mind, this picture of Jerry, which I, you know, just feel like, oh, you know, it gets to my heart. But this other one, people really seem to react to it. And how it came about was the story is in the book, but it was a night I, I needed to rest and I was just lying back in the bathtub and Jerry kept saying, get out, get out. He's very upset and like, please just let me rest. And he went in and he put on all our hats and coats and said he was leaving, but it was storming out. So I knew he wouldn't go. But I just finally, I just thought, oh, where is he? I've got to get out. And I went in and on the bed was this picture of his young self torn up on the bed and which was just, so heartbreaking. I just thought, oh, and he had said, he had said before he left, he said, where's my family? I want to go home. That just crushed me. So I had to get out. So I tried, I wanted to tell that story and also tell how later I found the, the color picture um, I had a young helper, Kat, who was really wonderful. She was a little crazy, but I came back and he had a picture of the two of them at the beach that he'd torn up and thrown under the sink. And he was like, he wasn't telling and neither was she what had happened, but I knew something had not been good. And so I, for the chapter, which did become the cover because it, I feel like it, it tells the story, lives torn mm -hmm. apart. Mm -hmm. um, I kept just trying to throw them down, like I found them. And it, I, it just, you know, I was throwing it on my scanner and it's like, it felt so unnatural. I couldn't do it. So I just found myself arranging them, just trying to put them back together, but there were parts missing. And, um, and then I took the piece of, a, a little picture of the piece of cat. And I thought, well, when this became the cover that I would on the inside, put more of the pieces of them at the beach, but it just, felt like, no, this is the only way this can be. So it's very, very telling. It really is. Um, are there things that you wish you hadn't included in the book? And are there things that you included that you wish you hadn't put in? Well, you, you were pretty good at that. Um, you got me to take out Psycho Ward, which I did. is my I did. black humor at the time. Kind of got us through, but I could see that it wasn't very tactful. Um, I do wish, and I've told you this because you you recently, you know, in your questions, you said, you know, you seem to have just so many bad experiences with doctors. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, those are the stories you tell because the story about the doctor at the facility who I found had been in prison for blood bank crimes along with his wife is a more interesting story than the doctor who was nice. But there, you know, I do talk about the geriatric doctor bowling who was so respectful of Jerry and um, so caring and I could have, and that is one thing I wish I would have done said, you know, and, and these other mm -hmm. doctors were as well. And it's just so important, I think with any kind of brain damage or illness to, to allow the patient dignity, you know, and um, Dr. Bowling really kind of went along with me not talking about Jerry, but saying, well, Jerry, did, did we want to ask about, you know, the medicine? Did we want to tell him about the 
dizzy spells. And so, yeah, that, that I would change if there's a second edition, I'll fix that. Are there things that you wish you hadn't put in? No. Nothing? Okay. Not really, because I, I, I did have a lot of readers and I wanna say, I was very, as a painter, I'm very solitary people. I don't really like to get any feedback until it's in the gallery, but with the, the writing, it was like, and you, you were sending it to everybody. Yeah. Oh yeah. And especially tried to get people who didn't know us or the story. And so you got, you know, you told me about writing classes because the hardest thing for me to write wasn't the heartbreaking stuff. It was the sweet part, mm -hmm. how we met. It, you know, they say happiness writes white. And I just thought, oh, I don't want it to be so mushy and sentimental. And, but, and it's right at the beginning of the book. So I thought, I don't want to lose the readers right off the bat, you know? And so that was a huge struggle. Some of my writing friends really helped me. I drove them crazy. It's like, it's just not right. Finally in frustration, well, if you move this paragraph up here, and that is, I've been amazed at how much writing is like painting, like shapes and structure. And it's really fascinating. And it's just a, a kind of the Zen beginner's mind, you know, starting something completely new at this stage of the game has been wonderful. I'm gonna change gear gears a little bit right now and ask you some, to tell us about some of the early signs that you saw oh, yeah. that made you concerned that something was happening with Jerry that was beyond absent-minded professor. Okay. Yeah. Be, in, in addition to the bucket one that you read oh, in the modern yeah, yeah. Um, No, that was a bit later. At first it would be, we would be in bed reading as he always did and he'd have his nation I noticed what he was reading the next night I thought I thought he read that article last night and the next night this is weird and you know he was reading a Nabokov book Glory which I had read and, you know tried to get him to talk about it and he was very clever at turning it back to me well what did you think but I started getting suspicious and um you know and that's when I would you know, and then of course, friends started saying something's wrong with Jerry and, you know, just, but those were, you know, but then the, you know, the doctor who had been my migraine doctor for many years, uh, um, um, he just said, it's classic absent-minded professor and told me this story about how Einstein had this long dinner with someone and the person came back and asked for his umbrella and Einstein didn't even remember he'd been there. So I thought, well, I guess so. And then honestly, I had never taught, but that year I started teaching at the university and then I was working in the kids clinic at MCV and I had like 40 names and personalities to remember and my famous memory started going and I thought, oh my God, Jerry's been doing this times 10 for 38 years. No wonder he can't remember stuff. But just, you know, it was little things like that. In the book, I talk about the more intense things, the driving. And recently there was something in the New York Times about they, they actually want to put GPSs on people because when they start, watch yourselves pumping the brake. <laughs> That's the sign. When people's driving starts getting a little aberrant, and Jerry's got very aberrant. He became crazy aggressive and he'd always been really a graceful driver. And it, it was, you know, I would just dissolve into tears. So yeah, the, the early more subtle ones, you know, I did try to talk myself out of, and I did want to believe it was attention deficit disorder, mm -hmm. you know, and, and he took, he was given Adderall. It had no effect on him whatsoever. So yeah. And what when you when you did take him to the doctor finally, it, it sounds like some of your experiences initially weren't the best. Um, and, well, and in fact, you know, there's a certain amount of bitterness I, I felt. Um, oh, well, there were a couple of doctors. I'm very bitter. I was not bitter towards the neurologist because 
he fell in love with Jerry, which is so easy, as you know, to do. Jerry could be, and my counselor talked about that it was like a radio station that sometimes would come in very clear. And Jerry also really loved the doctor. So they would just light up. And, you know, I have in the book where he writes in his letter, you know, Mr. Donato spoke so wittily about the trip to Berlin. His wife, however, seems to think he has problems with thinking and has convinced the, the patient, you know, and then I think it's very few months later. Yes, it's, you know, it's all over. It's terrible. His wife, however, thinks she can save him. Yeah. So that the, the head of that chapter is called his wife, however, <laughs> and the actual notes from that doctor are in, in the book and they're kind of appalling. With his name, I, to, you know, I mean, I didn't feel bitter towards him. I did feel beyond bitter towards the psych ward doctor. He was just a monster and I didn't, I wasn't the only one who thought so. The social worker called me and said, I just have to commend you. I've never seen anyone advocate for their loved one the way you did and stand up against this guy, not that it did any good. But. What, what was it? Um, I mean, you do, you describe in, in very difficult to read sometimes detail, what your daily life was like, some of the experience you had, experiences you had with Jerry. What were, um, what was it that finally made you realize that you couldn't take care of him at home anymore? Oh, yeah. Well, it was a few things, but um, I had this wonderful group of kids who were helping and I didn't want to leave him with them because I was afraid he might hurt them. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, I said, it, the real Jerry would be heartbroken if he hurt you. I said this to Megan and she said, the same is true of you. But I, I really thought, okay, then I have to do it. But one day, the back doorknob kept falling off. So we had this giant screwdriver to open the door. So the screwdriver was gone from the drawer. And this was a breaking point for me. I just howled, howl. And Jerry said, is it me? No, darling, no, howl. And I just, the, the feral cats were out there wanting their food. And I just went in the front and I called Freddie Jacobs, and I said, Freddie, I'm losing it. And she came over and she said, you're just facing that Jerry has to be in care. And I almost blew her off the couch. I said, that will never happen. And I took her upstairs and showed her how I was gonna fix it up so someone could live with us. But of course that couldn't work. With... So then I was talking to you in the little window seat where I would you know, talk to people on the phone for Jerry not to hear. And you said, you know, Joan, it's just dangerous. And you told me about someone who had set the house on fire. And I said, oh, you know, Jerry doesn't have matches and he doesn't go near the stove. That very night, I'm boiling eggs and I didn't put enough water in the pot. So this shows where my mind was because instead of just putting a glass and pouring more water, I took the pot over to the sink. And when I came back, Jerry had his hand in the flames, just fascinated. And that was just... I just thought we can't continue. And I couldn't, I couldn't without the helpers and I could not put them in that situation. Right. right. So that was, that was it. And, uh, and then we found this place that I just thought was incredible. It was a seven minute walk from our house and it just seemed really great in many ways it was. Did you, um, did you have any help in making the transition from having Jerry at home, a you know, help for you and for him and making a transition from having him at home to having him be in the place? Well, this is something I wanna say is, I felt like the way I did it was absolutely horrible. I just told this horrible, horrible lie to him, but the kids were all in it, we were just, I never really lied to Jerry and the kids, the kids were all in it. And um, I just, then all I did was lie. All I did was lie. I was constantly, I've got to go to physical therapy. He never, that was the one thing he wouldn't question, even if I had already been a couple of times that day. But um, it, the way I did it, and I realized in retrospect, because when I, 
got a counselor after this to help me find another facility, she told me something that was so important that I would say to anyone, you absolutely, even if it seems impossible, you have to find a way. She talked about refilling your pitcher, putting money in your bank. If you don't, you will have nothing to spend. And I think I could have handled all that better. There's some things that we did I thought were great. We got to know everybody there. But she and the head of the early onset support group both said, when you talk about your art, you are a completely different person. Your, your color comes into your face. You have to, you have to, she said, as if someone looking at your life every day would know by something you're doing that you're an artist. And then when we were established, I, I took three hours every day and um, that, that really was so important to me. And I don't know, you know, if everybody could do that. I also was spending almost three hours. I couldn't quite make the three hours with Jerry, which you're not supposed to do. That's the common wisdom, but we wanted that. And we did that too. But um, yeah, that's something I, I would just say is vital. You have to figure out something to do mm -hmm. that restores you and find that time somehow. Mm -hmm. are, are, is there, are there other things, I, you, you speak to this some in, in the book, other, other things, other kinds of advice you wish somebody had given to you um, that would have helped you get through this? I felt really a lot during this time that you were extraordinarily hard on yourself, that you were constantly saying, I need to do more, I need to do more, as though you felt like you could fix him. And if there was just one more thing, one more vitamin, one more change in diet, one more walk, that there was something that you should do. And I felt like that you, that, that was so hard, you were so hard on yourself. Um, are there, and I, I feel like that's sort of a common thing. I feel like, I feel yes, like people do, it is very do that. It's very common. Um, and it actually was the worst after Jerry was gone. I mean, I, another piece of advice I want to give is if you lose a loved one, don't do what I did. As I sort of tell my students who ask for career advice, don't do what I did, but don't do what I did, which was not, um, not go to a, a grief group. Mm -hmm. I just thought I've had enough grief. I just want to live. And I have this little thing, uh, life beyond loss that I found in my studio where I'd written in very pale pink. There is no beyond only loss. And it's in the show. I just put it there and you can hardly see it, but I sort of everything in the show is just as I found it. And I still feel like that. I think there's there's life with loss. You don't get beyond it. There's life with loss. But something else I really want to say is um, loss is so universal. This is one of the gifts to me of this book of people saying things like I told you about a student in the gallery said, I've been reading the book and looking at all of this. And then she's very young and told me she's mixed race and adopted. And I'm none of those things. But she said, the rawness in the book and here makes me feel understood. And we're both crying. Because even though we're just so different, loss is just universal. And I think that's important, really, to understand. And my counselor really helped me ultimately, because I also felt like all through, you know, that I should be okay. I shouldn't be devastated. And when I told her the last time I left here, when you told me just I had to accept that it was over, I just rolled in a ball behind Jewish family services and mm -hmm. sobbed. And she said, that's adaptive behavior. I'd be worried about you if you weren't doing that. And that was so good to know. That was just so good to know that, oh, okay. It's okay that I'm a mess. So those, mm -hmm. those things, I think, um, I was really lucky to have someone say, 
Yeah. And I, I think another big mistake is I stopped going to the counselor after Jerry passed away. And uh, I really, really, really had a hard time. I, in public, I was super jolly. A friend said, you don't have to be so jolly. And I said, I thought I do, because otherwise I'd be howling and everybody would run to me. But then at night, I'd be mm -hmm. like, why didn't I take him to Johns Hopkins? Why didn't I do that? Maybe, and someone said, well, do you think it would have changed everything? And I said, well, then I would have known I'd done everything I could have. What is everything? When do you ever get to everything? That's the problem, right? Well, it's true. Yeah. What, what were some other, what were some of the things that, before Jerry died, what were some of the things that helped you the most, would you say? Oh, I would say he did because he, he was so beautiful in his spirit. You know how he could behave really, really badly and get away with it. You said naughty. it's because he could be naughty. Yes. Very yeah. naughty. And um, you said it's because he genuinely liked women, but mm -hmm. I think he loved people so much. And um, there's something again in the science section, New York Times, I was reading, looking for things. They said there was some study that said um, we um, tend to think that what makes us human is um, memory, you know, projecting into the past or the future, but what actually distinguishes us as unique as human beings is our ability to project into each other. And I think Jerry had that as a teacher. You know, I run into students who'd say, I love that man. He tore up my drawing. And I'd say, but that's terrible. <laughs> but they just felt seen by him. I think we all felt seen by him. And then when he was in the facility with the other patients, you know, there was this one bipolar woman who everybody just ran because she would clamp onto you. And Jerry would just walk and, and the opposite arm, you know, and he'd feed her grapes, sort of like she was this pet falcon. And <laughs> that, um, you know, he, he really kept me going and just finding beauty in things, finding beauty in the moment. And he had a lot of courage. He, in the beginning, I think he must have known what was going on. And finally, I just said, you know, the time I said, we have to talk about this. He said, I don't want you telling anyone. And I said, Jerry, people are telling me. And he just said, I knew it. I'm my fucking grandmother who was crazy. And uh, so after that, I just thought, I'm not going to do this to him anymore. This is just the way we have to do this. And um, yeah. And I another thing that helped. very brave the way you, I mean, I, my tendency might have been to hide in the house, but you were out and oh. about. And even when he got, so it, it was very, probably very hard for you. To, I thought that was very, very brave. Of you. He came to life when he was out with people. I think people weren't aware of, because in the house he'd say, have you been here before? But when he, he would recognize people and um, he would really come to life. And I'm so, so grateful to those of you who kept including us, even though I had to take Jerry to the bathroom because he didn't know what was what, but he just, it meant so much to him to be with people and very much around students. So I really tried to get him, you know, down to campus and his retrospective was, you know, I sort of say in the book, it was like an Indian summer. It really brought him back to life working on the show, working with students. Are there other things that you particularly want to tell everyone that's here that we haven't covered? Or I want to say, if I may, my friend Chris B did do the right thing when he was, where are you? Um, asked if he wanted to be in the guilt, the guilt, the grief group, you said, well, is there a guilt group? And I thought that, that would have been great. good. But then of course you became a counselor. And I think helping other people, I think one thing that really helped me is I started working. I didn't want to work with little children. They gave me little children. I like the sort of young teen, but these little comments of love and, you know, feeling like, you're doing something for someone else was very helpful. But Chris, would you like to say anything about that or anything? Um, I think after the loved one dies, that um, 
there is grief, but I also think there's this other shadow aspect, which is the guilt. And I was going to, and I was left with that. And I found my way to let that go eventually um, through the help of other people. But I w wanted to ask you what, um, how did that dissipate for you if that was in fact an aspect of your grief? I finally told my sister, you know, every night I lay in bed and I can figure my jump ropes to hang myself off the back porch. And she said, you're not heavy enough. It wouldn't kill you. And I said, I'll, I'll use my 10 pound weight belt. And she said, you need to go back to counseling. And so I did. And my counselor said, why didn't you tell me? And I said, it's obscene to want to take your own life. And she said, what about some of that other behavior? I said, that was just life. That was just being crazy. But so, you know, she really helped me. And, you know, if you have the ability to get counseling, and I, I honestly wish I had, you know, I should have talked to my friends more about it, but I think it's terrifying. And I know that a huge fear for Jerry was being abandoned. And mm -hmm. I was, one day I was out driving, you know, he was still alive, still in care. And I was just a, right down Lombardi to get, you know, some art supply stuff at a for Micah store. Just a straight shot. And I came back, I have no idea how, but I got lost and I ended up on 95. And I, I was learned to drive very late and ran, and I just thought, I have it too. I must have the brain illness. And it turned out I just had some virus, but my very first thought after I have it too is I don't want anyone to know. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. just gave me a total insight into how he felt because you're afraid that people are gonna run and they do because I think it's way better now. People are so afraid of it for themselves, not like they'll catch it, but like they don't wanna see what they don't wanna have. So yeah. and. So I am forever grateful to the people who continue to include us in things that, that meant a lot to both of us. Um, are there other questions or comments that people might want to make? How did the illness affect your social interactions? Were there friends who shunned you or avoided Jerry? Yeah, there were people, but I didn't, I really understood there, you know, there were people who were very uncomfortable, but um, they had the illness in their family and they were afraid from themselves. But no, I think, I think my friends were valiant and, um, you know, and some friends who were really wonderful when Jerry, before Jerry was in the facility, apologize for not coming to the facility, but I don't think anyone should do it if, if it wasn't comfortable for them. It wouldn't be good for anybody. And then there were some people who weren't comfortable who came anyway. <laughs> and um, no, I, it, it was, it was uh, wonderful, but we, we did make friends in the facility. And the other thing I wanna say, we ended up in some kind of funky places because of Jerry's violence issues, you know, the, the you know, some of the, some places wouldn't have accepted us, but it was kind of wonderful in a way. We had a community, mm -hmm. you know, we really made friends with the AIDS and the other patients. And, you know, so uh, the, the worst thing was they kept changing hands and it, it was kind of never for the better, you know, and it was a constant battle about the food. I would bring Jerry food, but I couldn't stand seeing the other people eating, you know, so I was always embattled. The last facility was lovely, but it was so far away. That was really hard for me, you know, psychologically. Uh, I wonder if there uh, was an incident. Um, you talked about the fire on the stove, but in the book, Still Alice, she herself reported that she was in Harvard Square, which she walked every day and taught there and knew, couldn't find her way home. Was there an incident 
that he fully realized? If he realized that he never told me, but there were many incidents like that, you know, as we kept on, a friend took him to lunch at Can Can, he went to the bathroom and walked home. You know, there were many incidents like that. Christmas in Williamsburg, I was waiting for him in the bathroom. He had slipped out through the kitchen. <laughs> Williamsburg, full of people. When uh, my sister found him, he said, where were you guys? <laughs> you know? So, I mean, there were so, so many things like that, but whether there was an incident, he did, there was a really heartbreaking incident in the facility where he just looked at me and said, why am I like that? Why am I like this? And um, he was actually holding my wrist in rage. And I just looked at him and he just said, why am I like this? And I just said, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. That was a rare acknowledgement. Um, do you think that, what was his feeling when, when you decided that it was time to go to a facility? And, and did he feel abandoned or? I, mean, I was there all the time and okay. we, I mean, I told him this big lie about it being his emeritus suite. And he said, well, why are there nurses here? He may have been demented, but he, you know, he kind of could totally tell bullshit. And, um, <laughs> but we fixed it up. Our kitty was there at his drawing table, his art, you know, our bed. And, um, but I wasn't staying over. And that was one of my regrets. You know, I didn't. Um, stay over. And uh, another thing in an earlier question about something that really helped was we got this little pound poodle. Neither of us had ever had a dog. Everybody thought, you're crazy. Don't you have enough to do? And the dog <laughs> was, I mean, it was a he, special needs dog. He was a wonderful, he was a special dog. He was a wonderful, <laughs> one. he was very, very funny. And, um, you know, so in the early part where I would have to dress Jerry, you know, we'd both try to act like it wasn't weird or embarrassing, but when Puccini was there, we could just pay, laugh at him and act like this wasn't mm -hmm. happening. But no, it was, it was a big lie. And I, we went a whole lot before because the little band of kids, we painted it, you know, we put plants and um, we filled the kitchen and we got to know everybody there. And there was a really nice dining room. We got to know the cook, every single person, the names of their pets. We were there one week before he bolted. And what I didn't understand, and I say in the book is the Dom, the director of nursing, I did not understand was really, I'm an idiot. I want to say I was kind of judgmental. But I had told her that when Jerry had the spinal drain, they gave him Haldol and he literally turned into the Hulk. He threw me across the room out of his bed. So somehow, and I don't know how, you know, because you say a doctor has to prescribe it. And I did ask the doctor, how did this happen? And he said, because in the facility he was given Haldol and he threw an aid against the wall in the night. It's so, so I was told, but I never could find out. There were a lot of people in this facility. I asked everybody, you know, I, was like, I don't know about that. So I, I just don't know what happened there. And then, you know, but um, he, she, she gave it to him and I had told her this specifically. So that was a disaster. So the next place we went was right down by Elwood Thompson, um, but the Dom was very savvy and she really sympathized. And the place wasn't as fancy. They didn't have a little Cornish game in. They had meatloaf and gravy and he loved it. He loved it. His brother said, that's what, that's what Ma used to feed us when she was trying to be real American, jello cake, meatloaf. So he was, he was much happier without the choices. And it, it was a better place, but we kept getting farther away, a seven minute walk, a seven minute drive, and then very far away. But yeah, so no, I, I, I think though he did the day we left, we were walking out the back door. I was locking the door and he said, it's, I thought I said, what did you say? And he said, nothing. I thought he said, it's the end. So. 
How do you find uh, the courage to talk about your life experiences so openly? <laughs> well, I've been writing about this for so long and reading it in my writing groups again and again. And in the beginning, I would just be like, Ooh, I couldn't read it, I couldn't read it. And finally it was like, I just wanna get this sentence right. And so I have to say, the, it, it did take the sting out of the emotion, but also, um, you know, as I say, the motivation after Trevino said the book made him feel less alone, I thought, I just have to be, I have to be, I have to be open. And a friend of mine, another painter, Richard Roth, we talk about how writing is even more like standing on a table with your pants down than painting is. <laughs> so this is just, you know, extra added exposure. We have a couple of questions from the audience in the uh, Zoom room. Someone going by the name ASC says, uh, what surprised you, Joan, about the book now that you've finally gotten it out into the world alongside the show? The format is so unique. Are there any visual choices that you made that surprised you? In the show or the book, I wonder? I think both in the show and the book. Well, when the show started coming together, I realized that I actually thought of both of them as evidence. You know, here, here's a little piece of evidence that Jerry really wasn't missing. And even him saying someone's missing, and I think it's me, was evidence that he wasn't, he was still witty. But yeah, I think both of them. And, and I do wanna say, um, when you put the book online, uh, painting grad who I saw at a show and had a mask on, I, I wasn't quite sure I recognized her, was waiting for me outside the show and said, I saw on um, Cavill's website that you had a book and I'm three quarters of the way through and all the parts and pieces. It's as if someone knew what I wanted and needed and made it for me. And that just stunned me because I thought, I really thought of this as an art object itself. It has art in it, but I, for me, it was an art object it was making, but I didn't really know if it would be perceived that way. So that was kind of surprising that it was perceived that way. And it made me very happy. I made it like art, like the first ones like this, this is bigger than the book ended up being. And really, I think the color is wonderful, but I just ripped them all apart and laid them all over my painting floor and moved, moved the vignettes. And, you know, Elizabeth said, um, change them, you know, you asked me what my um, organizing principle was. I'd never heard of an organizing principle. <laughs> so I was like, and I said, well, I try not to have, you know, too many tragic things in a row. And you said, yes, the emotional weather. So I, I started putting little happy and unhappy, you know, smiley and unsmiley faces <laughs> on things. And then, you know, also visually, you know, the, the, the backgrounds and the images, like not have too many paintings or too many photographs or, you know, too many of Jerry's together, or too many of mine or this or that. And, and then there was the decision to make the whole advice part sort of distinctive with a gray background. So does that answer? I think so. And then we have another question from the virtual room as well. Could you talk a little bit about how your friendship with Sarah helped you through this time? Oh my gosh. Well, Sarah, you and Jerry um, connected on being from Chicago and are, you know, you and Paul are wonderful, important collectors. And then with the illness, you just showed up. I don't know how you did it. You just show up wherever we happen to be. And, you know, during the whole um, spinal drain, you were calling from riding in Florida. And, you know, as I said, the, the um, you know, you were the voice of wisdom that this just, this has, that was just really the turning point. And it was very soon after I had told Freddie that will never happen. It's just like, you know, and that, and then um, very important to me also, you know, you, were 
uh, Elizabeth and Freddie Jacobs had read the Modern Love Keys and helped me mightily with that. But, you know, I was, to answer your question at first, sort of like, would you read this? You know, it was pretty naked and, you know, you were so positive about it. And then when I had it, you know, sort of, I think this version, you took it and went through, and then you you told me about writing classes, which you were away for the summer, and I started taking these writing classes, and I thought I took a, a fiction one because it was the people you had been working with who you said were so interesting, and then I took the nonfiction thinking, well, I'll choose, and then I took them both, and the teacher said, nobody's ever taken both before. And she, I said, well, I'm actually working on a memoir. Can I work on that in the fiction class? And she said, everything is fiction. So um, you got me. And then we, we were a little uneasy about being in a writing class together, but, but we really liked it. And uh, it's just, it's, it's really a, a wonderful puzzle and just such a wonderful thing to share. You know, it's just a, a really wonderful thing to share in and you know we brought in other people and had little groups and I feel like you I thought in some of the, the my first two writing classes that I felt like I knew the people in those classes more intimately than people I'd known 30 years you know and um, now I'm taking a class just because I have to keep hearing the story of Yoko. I have to keep hearing the story. She's writing her memoir. And so I'm taking two back-to-back -back Zoom classes, one just to hear Yoko's story. So. Do we have time for another question or two? One more question. So we have a question in the virtual room, um, I think perhaps from a student saying, what advice do you have for a student doing research into finding their own voice in their practice? In writing? Probably in writing or art. Oh, gosh. Well, for me with art, you know, living with a painter who was a teacher, I finally had to just say, don't come in my studio. I need to know what I think. And uh, so I think that's important. And we, we lived in New York and at first I always loved people coming in the studio. And then I was actually relieved to come back to Richmond so I could just see, you know, what I wanted to see. And I had asked Jerry once, um, you know, what motivated him. And he said, I wanna see something that moves me. And I just thought, right. And you need to be quiet with yourself to know what that is. And then with writing, I look back in my early diaries and the voice was, was already there. And I did, I remember asking, um, saying to Nate in the beginning of the book, I talk about, I have this box of letters that Jerry had, I'd always known they were there. Jerry had written to his first wife and the woman he left her for. And, you know, the first night he was gone, I dumped that box in the bed and I was just reading them out of any order. And I just feel like it was a way to, to be with him. And I said to Nate, this would be um, my art kid helper. Um, this would be such a good story. I've got to find a writer friend to give this. This would be a great, he said, why don't you write it? And I said, I'm not a writer. And he said, Joan, I have hauled boxes of your journals and diaries and notebooks. And I said, well, I write, but that doesn't mean I'm a writer. That was a long time ago, right? That was 11 years ago. and. Um, so I ended up writing the story and, you know, people will say they like my voice, but people will also say, it's so poetic. <laughs> Why don't you write poetry? And I'll think, I love poetry. Well, I feel like you're still, and, and maybe this is true of all writers, you're still, just from being in writing classes with you, that your voice is developing and Definitely. changing and evolving. Is yeah, that, I was afraid going back and reading this after taking, you know, ever more writing classes. And definitely, I kind of, there was one sentence that I read to you that was like, this is a long time sentence. This could have been a few sentences. But yeah, no, it's true. And that's the fun of it, you know, figuring out what you can, how you can evolve. Same, you know, same with visual art. But, well... Yeah, I mean, it's hard. I don't think I'm an authority on any of this, but I do think 
first you do need to, and a lot of people say copy with um, copy with art in the beginning, you know, for me it was Bonard and Balthus, and um, some people will completely write out passages, but I'm a huge reader. I was really dyslexic, so I came to reading very late, and I, I didn't even know what was wrong with me, but I was so hungry to read that I read very slowly. So I had to just read, you know, like Nabokov or things that were really, really good because it would be excruciating to read bad things slowly. And I think, you know, we do learn to write by reading. Any final question in the room? Well, there's one more question that I will ask as our final question. And that is, could you tell us a little bit about why you felt you had to tell Jerry's story? Well, I, I feel like in a way, I, you know, I have said it. Um, I mean, sometimes I think, well, I could have written a book just about Jerry and not about the illness. I mean, really, I felt like it was a story of the illness and how we dealt with it. And, you know, I've, I do feel like being an being artist, it was different in some ways. And I think it did help. Like, you know, Jerry would be out under the huge um, pine trees in front of the facility and just taking the bark and arranging it. And he just, he was making art. He just was completely mesmerized. I think there was so much beauty in it. There was so much beauty in it um, that I wanted to share. And um, yeah, I, in the early onset support group, there was a young woman who said, you're all scaring me to death. And I said, there's a lot of beauty in it. And then I thought, well, maybe not a lot. <laughs> there, is, <laughs> there is beauty. And, um, it's so important to just um, hold on to that. And, and I think there is, you know, I think there is beauty in this book and, and humor. Did I say I heard a student, a student laughing reading this book in the gallery? Yeah, so. Well, thank you so much, Joan thank and you. Sarah. I feel so honored that this was my first public event as the Dean I and what a honored. special one, truly. A celebration of life, love, and um, thank you. So thank you everyone for joining us here physically in Cabell Library and those who are online. We did record tonight's event and we'll share the video with everyone soon. So stay tuned for an email message containing the link. And to everyone on Zoom, have a wonderful night and we hope you join us again soon. And to everyone here, Please help yourself to the refreshments that are in the back of the room. Please don't make us call them out. Um, and have a look at the printed copies of Joan's wonderful book in the back of the room. Thank you again.